and be with us. Amen. Would you guys stand as we get ready to head into worship this morning? It's a beautiful day outside. God's doing amazing things. And it's so wonderful to see everybody here. Let's pray as our worship team comes. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to get to serve in your kingdom. Lord, I thank you for every fingerprint I saw during vacation Bible school. I thank you for the children who were here praying. What a special thing to see you working in their lives. For the, the kids who are so excited to worship you this morning as they've been practicing and learning your word and hearing, Lord. I thank you for all that you did that we may not know about because they were seeing some, and one day we'll be able to see that fruit. I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for what you're doing here and all the ministries. I pray that your spirit is here as we welcome you into worship. I pray that your spirit resides as you transform us by your word. Begin all the areas of ministry this morning. We're welcoming our kids and our youth ministries. We pray that we honor and glorify you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Good
the Lord all over your life and those words mean something different. You feel every one of those words. Yes. You may be seated at this time. Um, we're going to ask our ushers to come forward. We may re remain in a posture of worship. Um, the worship team is going to continue to lead us um, in our time. It is singing and the kids are preparing outside the doors to come in. So we just thank you um, for being here this morning and for what God is doing. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to get um, an offering, Lord. We thank you so much, God, for your provision here. And you see the need of our season, Lord. Um, and, and we just come to you in this moment and ask God that you would remain our provider and our source of everything, Lord. I just pray for those who came here this morning, um, perhaps are struggling financially. It would be their heart's desire to give if they can. I pray that you'll meet them right where they're at. Be Jehovah Jireh, their provider, Lord. Be faithful and strengthen them. Lord, for those who have uh, purposed in their heart to give this morning of a tithe and an offering, would you also, Lord, help them to just reap what they've sown into your kingdom, Lord. And for everything that's given, would you help us, Lord, to steward it well for your glory and building up your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to continue with Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus.
with that. It hits home first. Um, the person that the Lord is speaking to it and writing it, they are convicted first and foremost. So, uh, Jonah is pretty much my life story. So, we're going to be doing one chapter a week. There's like four chapters in the book. So, it's a chapter of Jonah every week. So, you want to do your homework? You can go home during the week and you read the chapter or read the next chapter. Just see what uh, the Lord is saying to you about it. So, um, also, Jonah is more than a children's story. Uh, all my life, I just thought it was like one of the coolest kids, Sunday school or vacation Bible school stories, until I became an adult and I was able to identify with Jonah in many, many aspects. And so, um, it's through that that the Lord laid that part on, I mean, this on my most, um, this message on my heart a few weeks ago, um, particularly about camp meeting, I'll share some of that later. But um, anyway, as we get into that, I wanted to ask you this morning, have you ever been chased by someone. What's the scariest thing that's ever chased you? Is it a dog? A bear? A person? Has it ever chased you? A car? Maybe? <laughs> um, I can't say that I've had the pleasure of being chased. Um, it wouldn't be well for me. I would not get very far <laughs> to chase. Cardio is not my strong suit uh, at all. Um, but um, the scariest thing I've had, and what I had to laugh about this summer, is uh, my dog, it wasn't Joel's dog, actually. Uh, we were outside one day, and he decided to be so loving and generous that he was going to kill the critter and bring it to me as a gift. And so he's at the door, and he's got a possum in his mouth. And he's holding it, waiting to come in. And I'm like, no, no, this is not happening. I'm not opening that door. We're not going this route. So I sneak out the other door, and I'm trying to come around him and get him to drop it. Reagan and I were there. And she's, like, taking the broom and trying to get it out of his mouth. But he starts chasing us everywhere. Then it's a game because we're screaming and we're laughing. But it became, he's wanting us to get it and get it out of his mouth and take it. And he's like touching us with it. We're screaming. I FaceTime Joel. I was like, okay, where you are, get home and get your dog. Because I knew the minute the possum dropped, it was just playing possum and going to run and get me. And so it was the moment and a fun memory, but it was terrifying simultaneously because I would do critters and creatures like that. But that was a fun kind of chase and a funny one. But the scariest thing I've ever had to chase me was the Lord himself. And that was and has been and will remain the most terrifying experience that I've ever had is when he's had to chase me down to get his way or his will and get me to surrender. I would rather be chased um, by a storm or police or a beggar, whatever it is. <laughs> but when the Lord chases you, it's different. So... Um, we're going to talk about what that looks like this morning. Most of you know my story, how um, when I was called into ministry, I told the Lord no multiple times. Um, first, when he called me into the full-time ministry, I was pregnant with my fourth child. And I was very inconvenienced <clears throat> and very upset to learn these plans that the Lord had for me because it was like the worst timing. And I argued with the Lord, well, hi, could you not tell me when I was in my college? You wait till I'm like, pregnant with my fourth child to enter the ministry. It's a very inconvenient time. So I wrestled that out for a while. And then when the Lord asked me to preach, I've shared that before. I said, absolutely not. And I said, this is so terrible for me, but I said, you should pick a man that likes to be on the stage and likes to be seen and heard because there's a lot of them out there. That's not me. That's what I said to the Lord. I'm just being honest. I said, there's a whole lot of people that want to be on the stage and be seen. It's not me. Why don't you pick one of them? Because they're lining up waiting to be up there. And I'm good with being in the back. So, as you know, that did not end well. The Lord had to use dramatic measures to get my attention and to stop running. So that's why I was saying, it was in those moments that the Lord reminded me how much um, I actually am like Jonah. And um, it's 
not a compliment. <laughs> because um, you'll learn Jonah had some serious spiritual issues and some um, failures in his ministry and time with the Lord. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Old Testament book of Jonah. We're going to get all the way through chapter 1 this morning. He's tucked in with those minor prophets. In there, we're going to learn that Jonah is a prophet. What that means is in that day and time, he would be positioned to speak for God on God's behalf to God's people. He is the messenger, the go-between. And when people want to know something from the Lord, they're seeking, should we go to war? Should we do this? Should we do that? Should we come here? They go to the prophets. The prophets have the words, and the prophets um, give the words down um, and whatever they, whatever God tells you to say, you say. Be it good, be it bad, be it hard, whatever it is. That's how that worked. So, there wasn't a lot of people probably lining up to be in that position. It's not as glorious as you think unless all the messages are good. Um, we'll find out today that was not the case. So, in Jonah chapter 1, I'm going to start with um, reading and then we'll give a little bit of um, background on that. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of a mine. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I've seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. I don't want to go any further before I explain a few things. First, what's the big deal with what God asked him to do? Is this not the office of a prophet? Is this not what Jonah is called to do? You say and do and go whatever the Lord asks you to do. The problem Jonah had was that he only wanted to be a prophet and a messenger to his people. And with the messages so that God was going to work and have to do with his people, the Israelites, the Jewish people at the time. When the Lord asked him to go to his enemy, it became an entirely different situation and circumstance. So the Lord asked him to go to Nineveh which at the time, Nineveh is going to be the um, rising world power in Assyria in that day. It's going to be the most significant city and place. It's powerful and it's at the same time wicked and full of wickedness. And we don't get those details in Jonah. If you just read Jonah and you don't take the full uh, rest of the message in there, you'll miss out. But Nahum, in his book, he's also a prophet. He tells us all about the people of Nineveh at the time. He gives us this list as he starts his book out. He tells us the people plotted against God. They exploited the helpless people. That when it came to war, they, were, they had war crimes and they were an evil group of people who worshipped other gods. They dealt in idolatry. And the city was full of prostitution and witchcraft. Who's signing up to go? Not me. Right? Right? This is like, you want me to go where and say what? This would have been a 500 mile trip for Jonah. All of his Israelite friends and family um, are familiar with where the Lord is sending him. And this is the problem. Their whole entire lives, they've been told and taught how evil these people are. And they have been on the receiving end of a lot of those evil, heinous crimes and war crimes and that. It was on his people and to his family members and those kind of things. And so... Um, what they've been taught their whole lives is to hate them and to wait till God gets them. Just wait till God pays them back and gives them what they have coming to them for what they've done to his people. That's the mindset of Jonah and the Israelites at this time. That judgment should be coming. And so here's what Jonah wanted to do. Jonah's like, uh, no, I don't want to warn them. I want to send back the warnings while you destroy them. Why would you give them a warning? If you give them a warning, it means they have a chance to repent. So Jonah is angry and he's mad. He doesn't want them to repent. Jonah has a heart condition. 
a heart condition. And the first mistake Jonah makes is the same mistake that we make, and it's thinking that we know more than God does. And it doesn't look the same as Jonah, but it can be something that daily we have to wrestle with. We think we know what people deserve. We think we know what they have coming to them for what they did or what they said. We think we know what people are capable of because of their past. We think we know more than God when we think that way. It doesn't matter how we feel about people. It matters how God feels about people. And what do we know? How he feels about people. That he loved them and the world so much that he gave his only son. That's how he feels about people. So that is the reason Jonah is struggling here because it's all about him and how he feels about the people he's been asked to do that. Jonah has an attitude problem. Here's the attitude problem. He's got the wrong attitude about the will of God. He actually thinks it's optional. Jonah, I'm going to give you option A, B, C, or D. That doesn't exist. Uh, here's, here's my will for your life. Go and do it. Be in my will. There is no other place to be. So Jonah thinks he actually has an option. He runs as a result of that. He thinks that he gets to a, a pass or a get out. Like you can be a prophet when it's good and it's what you want to say and where you want to go. Like you can operate in the gifts and the callings of God when it's your place and it's your comfort zone and it makes you feel comfortable and it makes you feel good and it's one of your strong suit things. And that is not how God's will often looks for our lives. Um, I learned that myself when God asked me to teach and work at a certain particular school that was completely opposite of what my theological beliefs were. I said, you want me to go where and do what? I would be positioned. The Lord asked me to be somewhere where I was like a misfit. Okay? I was like the bad stepchild. <laughs> like, I didn't fit in there because as a staff member, I was the only one who didn't go to their church who didn't believe in their beliefs. I didn't dress the way they dressed. And I was a closet preacher and pastor. And it was completely forbidden for women to preach or teach. And actually, we weren't even allowed to pray in the sanctuary while men were in there. Because you, you don't get praying even with your sons and your husbands. And no women praying at the same times with men. And that's where the Lord asked me to go and work. Not for just a semester or a few months, but years. And it felt awful. And I had no staff that was like my best friends. They're my good friends and stuff to today. But he didn't care if I was comfortable there. He had a purpose and a plan. It was more than what I realized at the time. And coming out of that, my son, his best friends, now with the pastor's son, the pastor and my husband ended up working together, and God did so many amazing, incredible things in that two years. But I was in an uncomfortable position for years because that was the place God had me. <coughs> the next mistake that Jonah made was that he headed in the wrong direction. Where are you headed this morning? Where are you headed in the month of August? What direction are you going? Are you going in a direction and things are on your agenda and your calendar that's going to pull you closer to the Lord? Or is it so filled up with so many other things that by the end of the month, you'll be starved spiritually and drained spiritually? Where are you headed? Look at your agenda. Look at your calendar. Look at the places you set out to take your family. By this time next week or next month, where will you be with God? Where are the things 
and the places we are going, taking us. Jim Lyons is our uh, general director, and back in 2020, he said this statement to me, um, or to us, while he was preaching something, and I'll never forget. He said, you can buy a ticket to run from God, but you will pay a steep price. Have you considered the cost of where you're going? Sometimes it's not us that pays the price, but it's our children and our grandchildren and everybody around us is paying the price for us being like Jonah. True story of my best friend. And this is unbelievable, but it's the true story. This is her testimony. Uh, she was my maid of honor in my wedding, and I just want to tell you what the Lord did for her. Um, her mother was a Pentecostal pastor at a church. Um, the title they call her mother. Um, they call her mother. So um, when she was younger, she was unmarried. She had a couple children, and uh, she was not serving God. She was mad at God about all the things in her life that she had to endure. And um, as she was being angry at God and dealing with all the things that she had gone through, her mother had scheduled revival. Her mother always had revivals. This is what she had. She endured all the time. But this particular revival, um, while she was at her mom's house, the minister and the preacher of the revival was over there and saw her. And he said, hey, where have you been? You've not been to, you've not been to revival all week long. What are you doing tonight? Where are you going to be? Where do you have to be tonight? And she had this plan in her mind where she was. She said, I got plans. So I will not have time to be there tonight. He said, well, do me a favor. Just whatever plans you have, set them for tomorrow. And tonight, come to revival. Just, just one time, I'll leave you alone. I'll never ask you again. Come tonight. Here's what he did. He didn't know. That night, she planned to take her the life of her children's father and burn the house down. And she had it all planned down to the detail, down to every single thing, her escape route and all that. And when she told him she didn't have time to be there, that's what she was planning on doing. She had it set in her heart to take his life how to do it that night. And as she was listening to him, she said she thought, well, I guess I can do that tomorrow, and I'll go tonight. <laughs> what will it hurt? <laughs> she went to church, and she said that under the unction and the power of the Holy Spirit, he began to speak to her and call her out, saying that someone in here had plans in their heart to do something that would forever destroy their life. And she fell under the conviction and the way of God, and she ran to the altar. She gave her life to the Lord. And she has served him faithfully for over 30 years now. Never looked back. We can purpose things in our heart, the Lord knows. But being in the right place at the right time, that God asks you to be can change the, the direction of your life. Not just your life. That changed the life for her children. That changed the life for her grandchildren. That she now has grandchildren. She now has all of these things that could have been lost. In a moment, God did that for her. And he can do it for us. We are about to discover with Jonah what happens when we choose to say no and rebel. In verse 4, it says, The Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. Fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. Fearing death, they're desperate. First, they cry out to their God. Notice who isn't praying and crying out to God. The prophet of God. Where's he at? He's down asleep. Downstairs. He's all out here in the world. But he should be. I'm telling you, you can be asleep, and, and just because you're sleeping, that does not mean you have peace with God. At all. Jonah is sleeping, and don't 
mean, he was spiritually lethargic. And he was running from the Lord. He's asleep below deck. It says sign of his spiritual condition. He's no longer sensitive to God and his spirit. He is now, he's sleeping. And here's what we got to understand and glean from this story. That our prayer life dictates the direction of our life. Jonah is not praying. Jonah is sleeping. Who's praying? The sailors. The other people are praying without prayer. The direction is like the wind. We're going to go everywhere. It's the truth. Our first response should always be prayer. They had the right method. Prayer was the method, but they had the wrong God. Theirs was not actually the one true living God who actually commands the seas, the storms, the winds, and all that. Right method, wrong God. We do that too. Because sometimes we're going through the motions, the method of being in church and doing our reading or doing our serving and doing our giving. But money is our God. Or people are our God. Or wherever our heart is, wherever your treasure is, that's our God. That's your God. That's what they're experiencing then. So when their prayers didn't work, they pitched them off the boat. Pitching things out. The spiritual concept to get rid of things. Throw it overboard. Lighten your load. Hebrews 12, 1 says, strip off every weight that slows you down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. This is a concept that when you are trying to live for Jesus and surrender life, anything that's getting in your way, get rid of it. Let's go one deeper. Jesus took this to a whole new level. He didn't say it past me like, I would recommend, to highly recommend that you do not do that. What did he say? If your hand or your foot is causing you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. He doesn't play with sin. Get rid of it. He said it's better for you to enter into eternal life without a hand, without a foot, without whatever it is, than for you not to be able to enter into heaven. Get rid of it. Gone. No compromise, no in-between, no anything. That was Jesus' recommendation to us. Now, does he mean actually, literally? No. Of course he does not. He means whatever it is, stop playing with it completely. Rid yourself of it, no matter the cost to you. Because throwing cargo out or getting rid of something isn't very costly. Cutting your hand or your arm or whatever body part off will cost you something. But at least that cost will be worth it when you're able to enter into heaven. The idea the sailors had about throwing that overboard, it was a good one, but it didn't work. So when it doesn't work, the captain goes down through the ship. He's probably looking for more things to throw overboard. And what does he realize? The prophet of God is asleep. He is not bothered at all by this. He isn't worried at all. And he wakes him up and says, man, what is going on? Get up and pray to your Lord. We're, we're drowning. We're about to die out here. And you're just taking a nap. What is going on? And so he, he mentions to him to get up and go and pray. We do not read of Jonah praying. Not at all. So they go up on deck and they decide, we've thrown everything out, we've screamed to all the gods, we're going to cast lots. And that's kind of like picking names, drawing a straw. It's a practice that they did to see who is responsible for all of this. Who has made their God upset? Who is the one who needs to take the heat or do something? And of course, the lot falls on Jonah. Remember when we had our storm series and we talked about some storms come as a result of our own doing? It's a disciplined storm. It's a storm and a hardship that we brought on ourselves. And so this is what Jonah has to own in the moment. He is exposed and he tells them all, it's my fault, it's me, I'm running from the Lord. And they say, well, what can we do? Like, ask your God, what can we do to make this stop? How do we get out of this? How can this end? And Jonah's answer is, throw me overboard and the storm will stop because it's my fault. So if you want a storm, that's a result, that's a disciplining storm, that's something that we've created and caused all that chaos ourselves, the first thing you have to do 
stop, but you got to own it. Own your part. This is what I did. I made those decisions, everything leading up to this. Take ownership, own your part in the mess. Confess, come clean, acknowledge the cost, because this is costing every sailor around him. Everyone there, their life is about to perish because of him. And that's the cost of disobedience. Do we have the next slide, Clinton? We take ownership. His discipline and his running was causing them to lose all the cargo and run the risk of losing lives. And if you have ever ran from the Lord or had to experience a storm, a disciplining storm, you know, it doesn't just, it's not a rain cloud just above you. That would be nice. But everyone doing life with you begins to suffer as a result. As a result of our decision, every single person around us is impacted. Everyone that you work with, your children, your spouse, all of them are negatively impacted because of our decisions. That is what sin is. Sin has a ripple effect. None of our sin is just I'm the only person impacted. It's everybody we love is going to suffer if I choose to continue this way. Exodus 34 says, when he was giving them their laws, when he was giving the children of Israel, he said, I visit the sins of people, their children, their grandchildren, the entire family is affected, even children to the third and fourth generation. He let us know at the beginning of time, everything we do matters. Not just for today, for tomorrow, and their generation, and their generation, and it's running, rebelling, rejecting God. It comes with a cost and a price, and sometimes your children are going to pay for it. Your grandchildren will be paying for that. We understand when we see addiction and all the things that generationally cannot be broken in the natural because this is what we're talking about here. But listen to how the sailors respond. Personally, I've been mad at them. Like, what are you doing down there sleeping? You know this is your fault, good and well. I would have had a lot of words. I'm a wordy person, so I would have had a lot of things to say to Jonah. And I probably offered to throw him out before he offered it himself. But here's what they say. Instead, the sailors rowed even harder to get the ship to land. This is after Jonah said, throw me out. Throw me out. Instead, he rowed harder. And the storm in the sea, but the storm in the sea was too violent for them. And they couldn't make it stop. So they cried out to the Lord. Jonah's God. This time they're crying out to Jonah. Oh Lord, they pleaded, don't make us die for this man's sin. And don't hold us responsible for his death. Oh Lord, you have sent this storm upon him for your own good reason. Still, Jonah's not praying. All the people around him are coming to their senses and they're praying and begging and pleading God to deliver them and not allow them to die. They try harder, they do harder, there's more things, and Jonah remains selfish and self-centered and probably even saying, just throw me into the ocean. There's probably still a part of him that's like, at least I won't have to go to Nineveh. Just put me in the ocean, I still won't have to go there. Serious. He was probably at that point where at least I'm going to get out here and my chances are better in this ocean. <laughs> but the Lord arranged. We know what happens. He gets thrown. They do it. They do it and they don't want to and they don't want to experience that. And when they do it and they throw him over, all of a sudden the result is the storm stops at once. And they're amazed. They're amazed. They're amazed so much so that they turn to Jonah's Lord. They sacrifice to him and take a vow right there that they are going to serve the God of Jonah. Even in our running, he uses those moments to still bring people to him. And the good news is he arranged a great fish to swallow him. Verse 17, Jonah 
was swallowed by that great fish, and inside the fish were three days and three nights. This is the rescue plan. That God arranged to give him grace and mercy and a second chance. What does your rescue plan look like this morning? Because he's brought you here this morning to ask you to stop running. Are you not tired? Stop running from him. Let his grace wash over you. Let his peace fill you. Let the blood of Jesus cleanse you and heal you. Forgive you all unrighteousness. And come to him. Maybe it looks like maybe a first step. It should be coming to Jesus this morning. If you don't know him as your Lord and Savior and you say, I am tired of running, what is my first step? Is to come to Jesus this morning. To invite him into your heart to live, to accept him as Lord and Savior. But maybe you're here and what you're running from is a little deeper. Maybe counseling is your first step, your next step. Um, maybe confession. Maybe it's a phone call to someone. Maybe it's asking forgiveness. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you this morning? And what is one step you can take to turn your life in a different direction? There was a rescue plan for Jonah. It did involve going overboard, though. I'm not saying the rescue will be pretty or it'll feel good. It might look ugly. It might feel horrible. You may feel like you're drowning. But God made that the path to take back to him. And he has it arranged for rescue story. Would you stand this morning as we go into our time of prayer and reflection? The first step in the right direction can be in prayer this morning. I know they're decorated. Go to the end. We'll still meet you there. Can't one step in the right direction. Confession is made to salvation. If you've come here this morning and the Lord has been chasing you and you're ready to surrender, I'll pray with you this morning and meet me at this altar. If this morning the Lord has been asking something of you and you're running, will you make it right and surrender that to the Lord this morning in the prayer? What a beautiful thing. That God came to meet us here this day to stop us running in our tracks. What a merciful, kind thing he offers to us this morning. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word, Lord. I thank you that time and time again it challenges us, Lord. It, it convicts us. It compels us, God. It has the power to transform us, Lord, I pray. Now, when we hear this story, it's with fresh eyes, it's with fresh understanding, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you begin to speak through that word, Lord, to call and compel and convict us, Lord, to stop running where we're at, to check the direction of our life, to, to bring attention to the collateral damage we're causing our children and generations to come because of our choices. Stop us where we're at, Holy Spirit, this morning. Call us back to you. Meet us in our time of prayer and need. May we surrender and come to you for salvation, for your calling to say yes to you, Lord, and to be transformed by the power of your Holy Spirit this morning, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
back to me and you, 